The Tolkien Road, Episode 128, The Lord of the Rings, The Tower of Kirathungal. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through Middle-earth. On this episode, we continue our journey through The Lord of the Rings with Book 6, Chapter 1, The Tower of Kirathungal. Before we get started, please head on over to iTunes and leave The Tolkien Road a rating and feedback. It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. You can also stop by TolkienRoad.com, learn about previous episodes, and say hey. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Tolkien Road and on Twitter via at Tolkien Road. Thanks for listening and enjoy. Hello everyone, welcome to the Tolkien Road. John here, Greta, how you hey, doing? Hey, I'm good, how are you? Doing alright. Awesome. Alright, alright. Um, special thanks to our executive producers, Dr. William Hutton and Justine Lloyd, Woo-hoo. as well as our other generous patrons. If you'd like to contribute to the Tolkien Road, visit us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. Yeah. Um, so we've been gone for a little while. We, well, we did our, we did our, um, second Future of Middle Earth episode last week with that interesting, fascinating news. Um, haven't really heard any more f- from that, but there's been a lot of talk about it. Um, but no more definite details. We'll kind of keep you posted as we hear things and, you know, chances are if there's a big announcement, we'll probably do a special episode on it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, 2018 shaping up to be kind of a, probably a pretty interesting year in the world mm-hmm. of Tolkien. Uh, Tolkien so. Yes. You know, it's been a it's been a few years since there's been any uh, major film or you know media sorts of announcements. Uh, of course, there was Baron and Luthien this year, mm-hmm. um, and you know, but that's not quite. It wasn't quite. It was it was a big deal for really for people really into Tolkien, but not quite the mass appeal kind of thing that you would have from uh you know from another from a tv show or a or a film based on right. tolkien's work so right, yeah. we've got the possibility of there being further developments on the on the front of uh middle earth tv shows um and and then we've also got the two tolkien films one of which is definitely being filmed right now and um one of which is possibly going to be filmed uh, over the course of the next year so mm-hmm. big stuff yeah really exciting yeah really yeah. exciting time so uh, we need to do a drawing for October Ooh. and November because we haven't done drawings for our patrons. Uh, Wait, right, one for each? Yeah, because we didn't do nice. one for October yet. Oh, um, we're behind. Well, we only did like one episode in October, maybe two. But um, So we're going to do October drawing first, and then we're going to do a November drawing. And these are for, these involve our patrons, and they get to win a, a prize, Tolkien-themed right. prize. So we'll do... So the folks who have won within the last year are not qualified. So yeah, you know, so there's been you know we've done one since Jan- one every month since January. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so we basically got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people qualified to win for October. So we'll go ahead and do that. All right. Hey Siri, pick a number between one and nine. Random number between one and nine is eight. All right. So that's Lawrence McGowan. Congrats, Lawrence, Lawrence McGowan is our October winner. Yeah. So just write that in there so I don't forget. All right, so we got eight left now, so we'll do November now. Go okay. ahead and do November. Let's do right. it. Hey, Siri, pick a number between one and eight. Random number between one and eight is five. All right. Five. So that is Al Taylor. All right. All right. So, Lawrence and Al, I will be reaching out to you and finding out what uh, what prize you want from our vast and illustrious selection of uh Tolkien party favors. Tolkien get up. That's right. Tolkien get up. No, not get up. <laughs> I guess it's not it's not wearable Tolkien gear, is it? No, it's not. No. No. It's even better. It's Tolkien readable gear. Tolkien readable. Readable gear. Tolkien gear. Readable Tolkien gear, yes. Mm-hmm. Right on. Yeah. Okay. So here we are. Do we need to do we need to say anything about secret words? Oh there is a secret in? word for this okay. episode. So right. be on the list now. Uh, Greg chose it. 
Did we get we guessed the secret word for the last episode? We had a secret word on it. Right, right, it was confab. Confab. And Mary Grace guessed that one. So she'll we're a little kind of off. You got the email on that in the middle of the episode, we right? Did, uh, was it that one or it may have been that one? Yeah. I can't remember. Well, because I felt, I, th- I remember feeling bad because I think she guessed it in the middle of the episode and then we got like an email after that from David Bigwood, I think, where he oh. guessed that he guessed it too, right? Yeah. But I think he had just been listening, he was in the middle of listening to the episode and he hadn't quite gotten to the part where Mary Grace guessed Mary- it. Ah, so. oh, okay. That, that I think it was David, yeah, I think it was David Bigwood that, that uh, came in close second. It was for one of them. Yes, you're right. You're yeah. right. Yeah, we're a little bit off on our secret word schedule, so even though Mary Grace guessed our last secret word, her secret word choice we won't use until next week. So, because Greg guessed two in a row, mm-hmm. so this is Greg's second secret word choice that we're using today. So listen up. See if you can guess it. Booyah. And Greg, you are disqualified. You're not allowed to guess your own secret word. But he probably already did that. You have to be all harsh, like, you're disqualified, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> you're disqualified. I didn't mean it like that. From... I was trying to be silly. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so, it's a great secret word, though. You're disqualified so from life. <laughs> <laughs> well, he might be disqualified. Survey says, Brr. from dis- He might be disqualified, however, he is a really good secret word chooser. Yeah. So, you know, it all balances mm-hmm. out in the end. Boom. Yeah. All right. Boom. So listen up, guys. Listen up. Now let's get to work. All right. Book six, chapter one. Book six. This is the final book, yes? The Tower of Kirithungal. Is this the last book? The last, yeah, last book last of book. Lord of the Rings, right? Wow. Of the six books, halfway through Return of the King. Mm-hmm. And there's actually only nine chapters in this book, so I think that's the fewest chapters of any of the books. Oh wow! Right, so we are quickly nearing the end. You know, and um, and this one, this this book kind of, it's funny. Like the first few chapters kind of fly by, mm-hmm. and then there's like a long denouement. Mm. Denouement literary term. Do you know what denouement means? No, but it sounds really cool. Denouement is like after the climax. Mm-hmm. It's like the it's like the falling action to the final end of the story, right? Okay. So the climax is like the big thing. It's the peak. Right? Which the climax sits here about chapter three. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay. And then there's like six chapters of denouement. Okay. Right? There's some, you know, there's some really interesting, fascinating stuff that happens in the denouement. And I kind of like... But it's the post-climax story. Yeah. And I kind of like the, um, you know, the long... The long long. ending. Yeah. I do. You know, there's a lot to wrap up. Seems very Tolkien-ish. The final part of a play, movie, or narrative in which the strands of the plot are drawn together and matters are explained or resolved. So, Hmm. yeah. Not, you know, so we we were just watching, we just finished watching Twin Peaks season Hmm. three. And that was like a show with like no day. No (laughs) day anymore. You're like, come on. What's going on? I was like, wait a second. I, you know, I thought this was supposed to be the finale. No. In, a, in a way, they're, they're kind of well, there was, and then they, but they just like opened up a whole bunch of other can of worms, and you're like, what's going on? Please do another season. Come on, David Lynch. But yeah, anyway. they might. Yeah. Right. There's a I chance. I hope so. Uh, That'd be extremely disappointing. Maybe, maybe Denouement de, de is not David Lynch's jam. Maybe not. Maybe he just likes to leave it all hanging. Although one of the bands that played at the uh, in the you know, in the bar was called Denouement. Oh, were they? No, I'm just kidding. Oh. You just said it was not, wasn't a jam. So. Oh, ha, 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 <laughs> I made a joke. <laughs> <laughs> too bad I was too clueless All to right. pick up on it. Okay, so, book six, chapter one. We left off, so, so book six, the beginning of book six is all focused on Sam, mm-hmm. right? So, mm-hmm. when last we were with Sam, it was at the end of book four, uh, chapter 10 or 11, whatever the end of book four was. Mm-hmm. And Sam, Frodo had just been poisoned by Shelob. Uh-huh. Sam had fought off right. Shelob. Right. And Shelob had gone kind of scampering away and never to be heard from again. Mm-hmm. And and then a band of orcs comes by. Sam thinks Frodo's dead, and so he hides. Right. And then he realizes from their conversation that Frodo's still alive. Right. And so the chapter ends with Sam banging on the door you know some door into Kirithungal that he's been locked out of yes so we pick up with Sam right then and there right so he's 
it 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 picks up right here. So, um, why don't you go ahead and read the why don't you go ahead and read the first few paragraphs of this chapter? Okay, let me find it. Ah, here it is. Sam roused himself painfully from the ground. For a moment, he wondered where he was, and then all the misery and despair returned to him. He was in the deep dark outside the undergate of the orc stronghold. Its brazen doors were shut. He must have fallen stunned when he hurled himself against them, but how long he had lain there he did not know. Then he had been on fire, desperate and furious. Now he was shivering and cold. He crept to the doors and pressed his ears against them. Far within, he could hear faintly the voices of orcs clamoring, but soon they stopped or passed out of hearing, and all was still. His head ached, and his eyes saw phantom lights in the darkness, but he struggled to steady himself and think. It was clear at any rate that he had no hope of getting into the orc hold by that gate. He might wait there for days before it was opened, and he could not wait. Time was desperately precious. He no longer had any doubt about his duty. He must rescue his master or perish in the attempt. All right, so Sam is faced with one choice and that is to rescue his master at first right. at first of course before before he realized Frodo was still alive he's thinking okay now I have to carry the ring to to I have right. to carry out the mission to completion right yeah. um, but now he is now he's saying okay now I need to rescue Frodo so um, when is all this going on remember we have we have concurrent overlapping threads mm-hmm. of the story going on and so we learn a couple of paragraphs later that this is the 14th day of March in the Shire Reckoning, and even this is the day that even now Aragorn was leading the Black Fleet from Pelagir, and Mary was riding with the Rohirrim down the Stonewain Valley, while in Minas Tirith flames were rising, and Pippin watched the madness growing in the eyes of Denethor. Um, so, uh, we've gone back a little bit in time. Yeah, so we've gone back a little bit in time. Mm-hmm. All right, um, you know, this is before the triumph of. Uh, of the forces of Gondor and of Ro- and of Rohan at uh, this at the uh, Battle of the Pelennor Fields, right? Right. right. So, um, so even though the thoughts of the of so many of these forces are turned towards Frodo and Sam, mm-hmm. you know, it says here, uh, but they were far beyond aid, and no thought could yet bring any help to Samwise Hamfast's son. He was utterly alone. So Sam in a bad spot here. Sam in a very bad spot here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. The ring does... There's a lot of interesting stuff about the ring in this chapter. Um, Sam had put on the ring once already um, to hide from the orcs. Mm -hmm. And we see how it kind of increases the sharpness of his hearing. And for some reason, as he's sitting there kind of pondering, you know, his... What he has to do and how he's going to do it and all this kind of thing. um, We... He put... He just puts on the ring. It says, without any clear purpose... so, So we'll read a little bit before that. He halted and sat down. For the moment, he could drive himself no further. He felt that if once he went beyond the crown of the pass and took one step veritably down into the land of Mordor, that step would be irrevocable. He could never come back. Without any clear purpose, he drew out the ring and put it on again. Immediately, he felt the great burden of its weight and felt afresh, but now more strong and urgent than ever, the malice of the Eye of Mordor, searching, trying to pierce the shadows that it had made for its own defense, but which now hindered it in its unquiet and doubt. Um, as before, Sam found that his hearing was sharpened, but that to his sight the things of this world seemed thin and vague. The rocky walls of the path were pale, as if seen through a mist, but still at a distance he heard the bubbling of Shelob in her misery, and harsh and clear, and very close it seemed, he heard cries and the clash of metal. He sprang to his feet and pressed himself against the wall beside the road. He was glad of the ring, for there was yet another company of orcs on the march. Or so at first he thought... Then suddenly he realized that it was not so. His hearing had deceived him. The orc cries came from the tower, whose topmost horn was now right above him, on the left hand of the cleft. Sam stuttered and st- shuddered and tried to force himself to move. There was plainly some devilry going on. Perhaps in spite of all orders, the cruelty of the orcs had mastered them, and they were tormenting Frodo, or even savagely hacking him to pieces. He listened, and as he did, a gleam of hope came to him. There could not be much doubt. There was fighting in the tower. The orcs must be at war among themselves. Shagrat and Gorbag had come to blows. Faint as was the hope that his guests brought him, it was enough to rouse him. There might be just a chance. His love for Frodo rose above all other thoughts, and forgetting his peril, he cried aloud, I'm coming, Mr. Frodo. He ran forward to the climbing path and over it. At once, the road turned left and plunged 
steeply down, Sam had crossed into Mordor. He took off the ring, moved it maybe by some deep moved in by some deep premonition of danger, though to himself he thought only that he wished to see more clearly. Better have a look at the worst, he muttered. No good blundering about in a fog. So, um, so I'm kind of. I'm kind of fuzzy on how the the landscape of all this works out, but basically it seems like the tower of Kirith Ungol is actually on the Mordor side of this mountain range. Mm-hmm. Um, so he has to actually kind of cross over into. So he was maybe using a. Um, it's it's almost like it's on the downslope, you know, okay. the other side. Okay. So it's maybe like he had to cross actually into Mordor a little bit to actually get to um, Kirith Ungol, right? So. So um, he's not the gate, but he's at the gate of Kirithungal, right? Right. So, um, let me look this up. So, Kirithungal. Yeah, so, was a bastion in the pass of Kirithungal and the Ethel Duath on the western border of Mordor. So, it's on the western border. Well, and we know that. We know it was on the western border. Oh, okay. Um, so... It stood against the mountain face near the highest ridge of the Ethel Duath. From the west only, the round topmost turret was visible. The turret was supported by three great tiers that jutted out in a sharp angle, pointing eastward into Mordor. Yeah, so it's almost like it's on the eastward side of the mountain range, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it kind of is in the side of the mountain. So it's yeah. on the Mordor side of this mountain range, okay. right? Okay. And that's why he was only seeing the top of it from, from the other side, right? Mm-hmm. So he had to actually cross into Mordor in order to get into, in order to approach the main entrance of the tower right i see yeah, yeah. okay yeah so um so yeah so the gate that he's ha- at is not the main entrance and he realized the one he was at the, it before was like some kind of back door i see yeah okay so and she knew probably well, it wasn't worth waiting there right right yeah um let's see Tolkien me three drawings and with uh, the last picture depicts a uh, stage of four tiers let's see here Ooh, Tolkien artist and illustrator. I have that one. Let's see here. Oh. So an actual illustration by Tolkien himself? Yeah. Of the tower? Of the tower, yeah. Hmm. So... Too bad our listeners won't be able to see it. Yeah, sorry. Let's see. Um, 171, 172, 173. That's Minas Tirith. Um... Um, those page numbers seem to be wrong. Huh. Let's see. There's Shelob's Lair, so we must be getting close. Okay, there we go. Kirithungal. Huh. All right, here we go. Yeah, the Tower of Kirithungal. So, yeah, you can see it's on this side. There's like a pencil sketch of it. And it's right, you know, it's right over here. So he was, so basically, I see. Yeah. you know, Sam, okay. as he's coming up, he sees the tower over here and it looks like this distant thing. Mm-hmm. And it just looks like this little thing sitting on top of the mountain. Then he right. gets over and he sees it's a pretty tall, you know, it goes way down further than he realized. Right? Yes. So, so it's, it's meant, it's on the eastern side, it's on the Mordor side of the mountain range, but it, at the top of the tower is meant to have a lookout over to the other side as well. Right? That makes so. sense. Anyway, so... Um, so that's all about what Kirith Ungol looks like. And in the process, he actually sees what, uh, he actually gets a glimpse into the land of Mordor. So do you want to read that? Starting at hard and cruel and bitter. Hard and cruel and bitter was the land that met his gaze. Before his feet, the highest ridge of the Ephel Duath fell steeply in great cliffs down into a dark trough, on the further side of which there rose another ridge, much lower, its edge notched and jagged, with crags like fangs that stood out black against the red light behind them. It was the grim Morgai, the inner ring of the fences of the land. Far beyond it, but almost straight ahead, across a wide lake of darkness dotted with tiny fires, there was a great burning glow, and from it rose in huge columns a swirling smoke, dusty red at the roots, black above where it merged into the billowing canopy that roofed in all the accursed land. Sam was looking at Orodruin, the mountain of fire. Ever and anon, the furnaces far below its ashen cone would grow hot and with a great surging and throbbing pour forth rivers of molten rock from chasms in its sides. Some would flow blazing towards Baradur, down great channels. Some would wind their way into the stony plain until they cooled and lay 
like twisted dragon shapes, vomited from the tormented earth. In such an hour of labor, Sam beheld Mount Doom, and the light of it cut off by the high screen of the FLDF from those who climbed up the path from the west now glared against the stark rock faces so that they seemed to be drenched with blood. In that dreadful, dreadful light, Sam stood aghast, for now, looking to his left, he could see the tower of Kirith Ungol in all its strength. The horn that he had seen from the other side was only its topmost turret. Its eastern face stood up in three great tiers from a shelf in the mountain wall far below. Its back was to a great cliff behind and from which it, from which it jutted out. Yeah, yeah, okay. Its back was to a great cliff behind from which it jutted out in pointed bastions, one above the other, diminishing as they rose with sheer size of cunning masonry that looked northeast and southeast. About the lowest tier, 200 feet below where Sam now stood, there was a battlemented wall enclosing a narrow court. Its gate upon the near southeastern side opened on a broad road, the outer parapet of which ran upon the brink of a precipice until it turned southward and went winding down into the darkness to join the road that came over the Morgul Pass. Then on it went through a jagged rift in the Morgai out into the valley of Gorgoroth and away to Baradur. The narrow upper way on which Sam stood leapt swiftly down by stair and steep path to meet the main road under the frowning walls close to the tower gate. Yeah, so you know, really vivid descriptions of mm-hmm. this um, of this land, and then how it all you know the tower, and so yeah, Sam is coming over the he's coming over the kind of the the high point of this mountain range and down, and you know he's, he's really entering into the land of Mordor now. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but he's still in the mountain area. He's still in this mountainous area. He's actually, as he sees all this, he's standing above the the lowest part of the tower, Kirthungal, Kier, well above it. Yes. So, um, so we've got the we so basically he he kind of realizes as he's looking at all of this that that this tower was built long ago to keep not to keep people out of Mordor but to keep, keep people in, in right yes, yes. and um it, it was built by the forces of Gondor right it was built right. by them to yes. keep to you know to kind of keep Mordor as a as a prison land so that the bad things that live there the bad people the bad things that live there mm-hmm. couldn't get out right. right right to keep a watch on the land and over time, it had you know they had had to pull back as they became weaker and weaker. And you know the Tower of Kirithungal now belongs is, is firmly in the grasp of, of Sauron and the forces of Mordor now. So, uh, and he and even now it, it kind of says Sauron. Um, where is it? It says, since his return to Mordor, Sauron had found it useful, for he had few servants but many slaves of fear, and still its chief pur- chief purpose as of old was to prevent escape from Mordor. So even now. It serves his purposes. Yeah, he, he wants to keep people in, yeah, right? right <clears throat> because right. nobody, if there are very few, um, there are very few servants of Sauron that enjoy being in his service. Right, most a lot of slaves. So and it, not staying willingly. Yeah, it really reminds you of, um, you know, the, you know, like the kind of the the Iron Curtain kind of during mm, or the Berlin Wall. Yeah, during the Cold War, you yeah. know, designed to keep people from escaping into mm-hmm. the West. Mm-hmm. Right, keep people keep people in. There wasn't a lot of people. They weren't worried about people coming into the land. No, right, no. At least not civilians. Now, obviously, they were. You know, they didn't want the West invading into their land, but they 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 didn't want people escaping. Right, right. it right. was a one. It was a one way. You know, it was a one way thing. Hey, you're not going that way. Hey, you can come in this way if you want. Right, but you're not going out not that going way. Out. Right, right, right. So, same. You know, same kind of idea here with Sauron. So. Uh, we, you know, Sam is kind of pondering all of this, just continually wondering how is he going to make, how is he going to rescue Frodo? All he knows is that he has to take, put one foot in front of the other and make an effort. Uh, it says his thought returned to the ring, but there was no comfort there, only dread and danger. So uh, as he drew near uh, to the furnaces where in the deeps of time it had been shaped and forged, the ring's power grew and it became more fell, unta- untamable, save by those, saved by some mighty will. And, uh, and it, you know, it kind of starts to put Sam to a test here, right? Yes. Um, he's, you know, he's starting to wonder, well, should I use the ring for mm-hmm. these purposes, right? Mm-hmm. To, you know, it's in my possession. Should I use it in order to rescue Frodo or in, or, you know, in order to uh, do whatever? Mm-hmm. And so it says in that hour of trial, it was the love of his master that helped most to hold him firm. 
He also deep down in him lived still, but also deep down in him lived still unconquered his plain hobbit sense. He knew in the core of his heart that he was not large enough to bear such a burden, even if such visions were not a mere cheat to betray him. The one small garden of a free gardener was all his need and due, not a garden swollen to a realm, his own hands to use, not the hands of others to command. Um, I like that. I like that little passage. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like, I feel like that's... His own hands to use, not the hands of others to command. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like I could relate to that a whole lot, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm personally not somebody who, um, you know, has a desire to, like, have a big business or anything like that and tell people what to do, you know. Um, I do, I can do that, you know, if, if I need to, yeah. you know, I can yeah, be yeah. in charge, sure. but it's, it's never been a desire of mine and it, at least I guess a, a recurring desire, you know, Yeah. there's always something alluring though, even to people who probably don't normally have it about the idea of like you, that kind of, it's, the thing, the thing is for Sam, it's like, it's silly for him, right? Because he's just like, no, that's not me. Like. The mo- the ring tries to tempt him, mm-hmm. right? Because it's his power, right? Yeah. To say like Sam, you could be Samwise the Great, mm-hmm. right? Samwise and you know leading these armies and people bowing. We've seen this happen already with Gandalf and with Galadriel mm-hmm. and others, where they're like they're people of greater stature who are much more inclined to inclined to that to. sort of yeah, thing, right? And so it's a serious temptation for them. But for right. Sam, yeah, he's like. It, it barely it barely even scratches the surface of his yeah. psyche, right? He's just like that's silliness. That is silly. You know? I just wanna I just wanna hang out in my garden and pull weeds and serve my master. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he says the one small garden of a free gardener was all his need and do. Not a garden swollen to a realm. His own hands to use, not the hands of others to command. Um, I still take. I don't want to diminish though, like how how um, like the strength it took. For him to refuse this temptation. I mean, maybe it wasn't as difficult for him as it would have been, like, say, for Gandalf or Galadriel. But I think it still shows great strength of character oh, on his no doubt. part. No doubt. And really, you know, an ability to kind of keep cool under pressure, right? To kind of keep the reality, the end game, if mm-hmm. you will, in sight and not fall to what the ring's trying to get them involved to. No, no doubt. I mean, I'm not, you know, and it's not meant to diminish what Sam... You know the fact that Sam doesn't succumb to the temptation, but um, but it's interesting to see how it differs with him. His rea- how is his, his reaction? His reaction to right. others, right. right? Yes, I agree. You know, Sam, it, it's um, it's not as difficult a temptation for him to overcome, and right. so it's you know why is that? Well, it's because he's he's just different. He doesn't he doesn't have this self image of himself that says like, oh, I'm Mister, you know, mm-hmm. I'm Mister in charge. He doesn't aspire to be that. Right. 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 He's, He's just, happy to be just a humble servant. Right. Yeah, you contrast this, you know, to to the the temptation of Boromir, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's night and day. Um, yes. But. Yeah, most definitely. But yeah, go Sam. Go Sam. Yeah. So, uh, he says, in any way, all these notions are only a trick. He'd spy me and cow me before I could so much as shout out. He'd spot me pretty quick if I put the ring on now in Mordor. Well, all I can say is this. Things look as hopeless as a frost in spring. Just when being invisible would be really useful, I can't use the ring. And if ever I get any further, it's going to be nothing but a drag and a burden every step. So what's to be done? Um, and at that moment, uh, he starts to hear cries and sounds of fighting coming uh, from the walls of the tower. And so he approaches He approaches even closer, kind of wondering what's, what's going on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he approaches, he gets close to the gate, to the main entrance, and... Um, it, you know, and, and he starts to realize that he, he's, he puts two and two together and he realizes that they're probably fighting over the mithril coat, right? Over Frodo's mithril coat, mm, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the, the orcs. And so, you know, he's starting to think to himself, okay, so Frodo might still be alive, right? Mm-hmm. And there's a chance. So he, he pushes on. And as he gets close to the entrance, he, uh, he, runs up against this strange wall, right? He says, He drew Sting and ran towards the open gate, but just as he was about to pass under its great arch, he felt a shock, as if he had run into some web-like she lobs, only invisible. He could see no obstacle, but something too strong for his will to overcome barred the way. He looked about, and then within the shadow of the gate he saw the two watchers. They were like two great figures seated upon thrones. Each had three joined bodies and three heads facing outward and inward and across the gateway. 
The heads had vulture faces, and on their great knees were laid claw-like hands. They seemed to be car carved out of huge blocks of stone, immovable, and yet they were aware. Some dreadful spirit of evil vigilance abode in them. They knew an enemy. Visible or invisible, none could pass unheeded. They would forbid his entry or his escape. Hardening his will, Sam thrust forward once again and halted with a jerk, staggering as if from a blow upon his breast and head. Then greatly daring, because he could think of nothing else to do, answering a sudden thought that came to him, he drew slowly out the feel of Gladrail and held it up. Its white light quickened swiftly, and the shadows under the dark arch fled. The monstrous watchers sat there cold and still, revealed in all their hideous shape. For a moment Sam caught a glitter in the black stones of their eyes, the very malice of which made him quail. But slowly he felt their will waver and crumble into fear. He sprang past them, but even as he did so, thrust thrusting the feel back into his bosom. He was aware as plainly as if a bar of steel had snapped to bind him, to, and snapped to behind him that their vigilance was renewed. And from those evil heads there came a high shrill cry that echoed in the towering walls before him. Far up above, like an answering signal, a harsh bell clanged a single stroke. So, um, so you've got these really mysterious yeah. thing statues. So are they alive? It's, I don't know, it's it's so, um, you know... They're not really mysterious. Yeah, fascinating little touch. Mm hmm You know, and it's, um, it's surprising to me, you know, because I remember they don't, do any, they don't do anything with these in the movie. I think oh, they really? actually, I think there's actually, you can actually see them, but they never, like, acknowledge them, or, like, there's no, they don't stand out, right? Hmm. And it surprises me, because you think, as visual as this kind of image would be, that there would be something, but it's, but... What is going on here is very mysterious. Like yeah. he runs. What's this wall he's running up against? You know, it's clearly some kind of source, like no, oh, right? abs absolutely, some yeah. kind of sorcery, some kind of black magic. Exactly, some kind of magic is going on. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. it, uh, it's funny to me to think about this because you know we're in in today, twenty seventeen. We're accustomed to there being like all kinds of alarming devices, right? You know, if you if you're getting getting into a place that's meant to be secure. You know, you can have an invisible alarm device where it's like an infrared sensor. You right. know that that I I have one where we're recording right now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where if I turn it on and somebody starts moving around in here, mm -hmm. then it's going to sound an alarm, right? Right, and a really right. nasty like meow 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 yeah. meow meow. You know, yeah. um, and and here you know we are in this ancient ancient story, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember what, and, and we have kind of a similar thing, except you know with the bell. You have this mysterious thing that you don't understand necessarily, you know, how it works, but there's some kind of invisible uh, force. So, yeah. my point is, um, the Walden, Waldem, letter, I'm getting that wrong. It's Walden. Waldman. Waldman letter, thank you. The Waldman letter. He talks about, Tolkien talks about magic and how, right. and how the Elvish arts are not magic, right? Magic, he mm -hmm. associates with uh, Morgoth and with Sauron, right? Magic are their artful devices in order to, uh, you know, for the purposes of like making war and for putting, um, for putting not for developing, uh, not for developing nature in a in a way more more consistent with its nature with what it's meant to be, right? But in a way of putting nature to your service of making nature your slave, right? Right, of making nature unnatural in a way, right? Yeah. And for in in order for to your purpose. in for order your to achieve your purpose, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so it's interesting to me to think about like the the whole like we we're used to these like alarms to making alarms for our purposes, and how Tolkien associates magic with technology, right? With like advanced, you know, mm -hmm. it, for him it's like magic is about technology, right? Yeah. Um, it's about saying okay, how can I manipulate nature? And and, and not to say that all technology is bad, obviously. We would if we didn't. If we didn't have technology, we wouldn't be talking to you like this right now. Right. But, um, but for Tolkien, he he, in his philosophy and in his writing, he made a very sharp distinction between uh, art and technology. Yes. And you know, this is this is and when, with technology, he called it more magic. So anyway, I just think I just see a parallel there, like in 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 this what I you know, assuming that Sauron placed these statues there or one of the ring wraiths or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, they did it with magic, right? There's some kind of magic in effect right. here, right? Right yeah. for you know some kind of devilry, mm -hmm. as um, as Sam would call it. And it's just, in, but it, of course, there's the added effect. That there's like an invisible force field that Sam can't quite get past, right? 
But then right. once you do, well, he takes the feel of Galadriel, and that enables him to, to cross over the threshold. That's right. So. Yeah. He basically ambuscaded them with the light. That's right. Of Galadriel. Ambuscaded those statues. I mean, he just, like, put it to them. Yeah. They totally didn't see it coming. All right. So. And so he gets through. He does. He makes it through. But the bell sounds, the alarm sounds, because he puts it away too quickly. <laughs> And uh, oh. it's almost like the light blinds the statues. Yes. And yes. then he puts it away and they can see him then. And then they're like, you know, they, they give out their cry. Right. And, right. And then the bell sounds. So Sam runs, you know, he's got to climb this huge tower, um, you know, find his way up. And, you know, he doesn't know what he's going to find. But as he gets further in, he starts to realize that a lot of the work of killing orcs has already been done between them, between mm-hmm. the two orc parties. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's the ones that inhabit the tower. And then there's the ones that were kind of going back and forth. You know, um, and I think it's, um, I'm probably going to mess this up. Yeah, I was going to say, let's not even talk about it. We're going to mix them up. Uh, but you basically have the party of Gorbag and you have the party of Shagrat, right? Right, right. So. And let's just say again, like, how perfect those orc names are. Mm-hmm. They're just perfect orc names. Yeah. Yeah. You know, your orc name would be um, Garshnart. Garshnart. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You I'm think that's sh- fierce enough? I don't know. It doesn't give me, like. I don't know. It chills, depends on what it means. Like, I guess it does. Shagrat. I mean, Shagrat and Gorbag sound a little bit... They just sound gross and kind of humorous in a way. Yeah. Yeah. True. What would your orc name be? I don't know. Hmm. I thought we talked about this already. Oh, well, I don't want to get us down a rabbit trail. All right. Let's just suffice it to say that Shagrat and... Maybe somebody can propose Shagrat an orc name for me. Shagrat and Gorbag. Yeah. Or if you, you want to propose names. an orc name for me, Tolkien Road Podcast at gmail.com. Do it. Do it. All right. So... Sam, the elf warrior. Yay, Sam. So Sam is climbing up, you know, climbing up and further and further into the tower. And, he's, and he actually comes upon an orc at, uh, at one point. And it says, um, His will was too weak and slow to restrain his hand. It dragged up the chain and clutched the ring, but Sam did not put it on. For even as he clasped it to his breast, an orc came clattering down. Leaping out of a dark opening at the right, it ran towards him. It was no more than six paces from him when, lifting its head, it saw him. And Sam could hear its gasping breath and see the see the glare in its bloodshot eyes. It stopped, it stopped short, aghast. For what it saw was not a small frightened hobbit trying to hold a steady sword. It was a great silent shape, cloaked in a gray shadow, looming against the wavering light behind. In one hand it held a sword, the very light of which was a bitter pain. The other was clutched at its breast, but held concealed some nameless menace of power and doom. So... Even though Sam hasn't put on the ring, when this orc sees him, it's not seeing a little hobbit. It's seeing some kind of, um, it, 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 it says, was not a frightened hobbit. It was a great silent shape cloaked in a gray shadow. So Sam somehow is giving off this aura of being this like great elf warrior. Is that warrior. because of the ring, though? Or do you think it's... I don't know. It's an interesting yeah. question. It, it could be because of the ring. It could have to do with Sting as well, right? Because Sting is giving right. off this great light being around orcs. I can't right. imagine. See, that's what kind of confused me because I was like, this is a good thing for Sam, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't think of the ring as helping people. Yeah. Right? So that's why I thought it couldn't be the ring. I mean, it could have something to do with the field of Galadriel. I don't know. Right. right? Yeah. But there's something going on here. Some some assistance uh, some kind given of to Sam. Divine, But it's divine assistance, wouldn't yeah. you well, say? Well, superna- it's supernatural, right? It doesn't right, really make sense. Help. It's not a hindrance, right? Right. Yeah. So it's probably not the ring. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Well, he is holding, like you said, he's holding the feel. Mm-hmm. Right? And then he also has Sting. And does he have the cloak at this point, too? Does he have... He has the elven, the elvish cloak, mm-hmm. right? So, it's probably one of those. See, but here's the thing. like, So, on the ring, right? The ring is not... Just because the ring is full of, of malice, mm-hmm. it, it does... In a way, it does serve the one who... Who possesses it? Okay. 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 So right now Sam is the master of it, right? Yeah. Yep. So he does possess it, and it does serve him. But the point of the ring is that, uh, as you put it to as you put it to use, mm-hmm. as you think you're the master, it starts to master you, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And that's that's the that's the trick of the ring, right? Because it was made by Sauron for his purposes only, right? Mm-hmm. And it's got his will ultimately in it, and it's. The ring does have like a personality, but it's 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 not quite like a um you know like it's like working against him, right? I it's, see. I don't know. 
It's that it's a that's it's a fascinating question. It's trying to serve question. its own purpose, right? Right, and if it can serve its purpose by helping Sam get past this orc, right? Then maybe, yeah. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The ring is it's it's, tri- it's Trixie. It's I was going to say the same ring. thing. Trixie, you know. Yep. All right, so, um, and so the orc turns and runs, and Sam chases after. Yes, the elf warrior is loose. He he cried, "I'm coming! Just you show me the way up, or I'll skin you." Um, so does, Sam doesn't know how he's being portrayed, right? Like he can't see him. He can't see himself mm-hmm. as the orc sees him. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. So he's just so this elf warrior. The, the fact that he calls himself an elf warrior is purely coincidental here. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think so. But anyway, so he chases. He gives chase to the orc, but the orc is too fast, and Sam's too small and slow and tired. And so the orc gets away from him, but he continues up the stairs, mm-hmm. and he listens in to the argument between Shagrat and one of Shagrat's... Um, oh, so Shagrat is the captain of the tower, and then Gorbag, I think, is the one that came from Lugbors. Okay. Um, and But Snaga is one of Shagrat's soldiers, right? Okay, right. And then, but now they're fighting, and you know, they're just fighting over stupid stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not going down those stairs again," crowd Snaga. So it must have been Snaga that saw. That's all, Sam. Sam. Yeah. Be you captain or no, Nar? Keep your hands off your knife, or I'll put an arrow in your guts. You won't be a captain long when they when they hear about all these going when they hear about all these goings on. I fought for the tower against those stinking Morgul rats, but a nice mess you two precious captains have made of things fighting over the swag. That's enough from you," snarled Shagrat. "I had my orders. It was Gorbag start started it, trying to pinch that pretty shirt." Well, you put his back up, being so high and mighty, and he had more sense than you anyway. He told you more than once that the most dangerous of those spies was still loose, and you wouldn't listen. And you won't listen now. Gorbag was right, I tell you. There's a great fighter about, one of those bloody-handed elves, or one of those filthy Tarks, which is a person from Gondor, mm-hmm. if you look it up in the appendix. Okay. He's coming here, I tell you. You heard the bell. He's got past the Watchers, and that Tark's work, and that's Tark's work. He's on the stairs, and until he's off them, I'm not going down. Nod, if you were in Nazgul, I wouldn't. So that's it, is it? yelled Shagrat. You'll do this and you'll not do that. And when he does come, you'll bolt and leave me? No, you won't. I'll put red maggot holes in your belly first. Out of the turret d- door, the smaller orc came flying. Behind him came Shagrat, a large orc with long arms that, as he ran crouching, reached to the ground. But one arm hung limp and seemed to be bleeding. The other hugged a large black handle. In the red glare, Sam, cowering behind the stair door, caught a glimpse of his evil face as it passed. It was scored as if by rending claws and smeared with blood. Slaver dripped from its protruding fangs. The mouth snarled like an animal. So Shagrat is chasing Snaga now, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And just, Shagrat's down an arm. Right. And uh, as Shagrat gives chase, um, he, he you know he stops at, he stops at one point and looking uh, leaning over the parapet to see where Snaga is going. And even as this happens, Sam sees another orc who's lying on the ground start to get up and start to sneak up behind Shagrat. Mm-hmm. Turns out it's Gorbag, Bag. and Snaga yeah. puts an end to Gorbag. Yep. Or, I'm sorry, Shagrat puts an end to Gorbag. So, quick as a snake, Shagrat slipped aside, twisted around, and drove his knife into his enemy's throat. So, um, so Gorbag had tried to play dead, tried to get at Shagrat, and it failed. So, uh, just a tower of misery here. Tower of orcish yeah, misery. Yeah, fighting and <laughs> death yeah, and... I guess that's what orcs will do. War and... Yeah. yeah. Um, so... Um, it's kind of a blessing for Sam, though. Right. right. I mean, this is making his job a bit easier. Mm-hmm. All this infighting, orcs killing each other. Right. So, uh, so at this, Sam jumps out to meet Shagrat with a shout. He was no longer holding the ring, but it was there, a hidden power, a cowing menace to the slaves of Mordor. And his hand was in his hand was Sting, and its light smote the eyes of the orc like the glitter of cruel stars in the terrible elf countries, the dream of which was a cold fear to all his kind. And Shagrat could not uh, both fight and keep hold of his treasure. He stopped, growling, baring his fangs. Then, once more, orc fashion, he leapt aside, and as Sam sprang at him, using the heavy bundle as both shield and weapon, he thrust it hard into his enemy's face. Sam staggered, and before he could recover, Shagrat darted past and down the stairs. Sam ran after him, cursing, but he did not go far. So he basically chases off Shagrat, mm-hmm. but, and Shagrat runs out of the tower, uh, but he's got the mithril coat with him, 
right? Which is how, obviously, at the end of Book Five, right when they they're at the uh, gates of Mordor, the the uh, Aragorn and the company of Gondor at the gates of Mordor. That's why the mouth of Sauron is able to hand the mithril coat to, um, you know, to uh, to Aragorn to the company of Aragorn. Right. Oh, because Shagrat brought it to him. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I see. So okay, but here we have another ambuscade, right? Yeah. Sam, man, he is just like full of ambuscades. He is. He's an ambuscading hobbit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ambuscader. Yeah. Of course, this one didn't. You know, I mean, I, I probably would have preferred to have killed Shagrat, but mm-hmm. you know, at least he got him out of his way. He did. He did. That's all that really matters. Yep. So, so Sam appears to be pretty much all alone. Um, within uh, the tower at this point, uh, although we don't really know exactly where what ha- what what happened with Snaga, so Snaga maybe oh, still right. about, yeah. out and about. Yeah, uh, we don't know yet. So Sam continues climbing the tower, looking for uh, looking for Frodo. He thinks he comes to a dead end, mm-hmm. and it says, "You want to read it last?" Weary and feeling finally defeated. At last, weary and feeling finally defeated, he sat on a step below the level of the passage floor and bowed his head into his hands. It was quiet, horribly quiet. The torch that was already burning low when he arrived sputtered and went out, and he felt the darkness cover him like a tide. And then softly, to his own surprise, there at the vain end of his long journey and his grief, moved by, by what thought in his heart he could not tell, Sam began to sing. His voice sounded thin and quavering in the cold, dark tower, the voice of a forlorn and weary hobbit that no listening orc could possibly mistake for the clear song of an elven lord. He murmured old childish tunes out of the shire and snatches of Mr. Bilbo's rhymes that came into his mind like fleeting glimpses of the country of his home. And then suddenly new strength rose in him, and his voice rang out while words of his own came unbidden to fit the simple tune. Do you want me to read the... Uh, go ahead. Tune the song. In western lands beneath the sun, the flowers may rise in spring. The trees may bud, the waters run, the merry finches sing. Or there may be, tis cloudless night, and swaying beeches bare. The elven stars as jewels white amid their branching hair. Though here at journey's end I lie, in darkness buried deep, beyond all towers strong and high, beyond all mountains steep. Above all shadows rides the sun, and stars forever dwell. I will not say the day is done, nor bid the stars farewell. Awesome poem. Yeah, it's beautiful. I love that poem. So that's an original, right? He started with things he already knew from other people, but then this was inspired Mm -hmm. by him, right? Yeah. Um, Well, words of his own came unbidden to fit the simple tune, Mm -hmm. right? And... um, and so you know, and and I just love love the love this poem. Mm-hmm. I love the you know, especially the second stanza. Though here at journey's end I lie in darkness buried deep, beyond all towers strong and high, beyond all mountains steep, above all shadows rides the sun and stars forever dwell. I will not say the day is done, nor bid the stars farewell. So you know, this is basically this poem is you know, even though my end might be here. Mm-hmm. I will not say the day is this. The stars still exist above the clouds, right? And the sun will still rise, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I will not say the day is done, nor bid the stars farewell. So, um, you know, Sam, things are feeling pretty dark mm-hmm. for poor Sam right now. He doesn't mm-hmm. know where Frodo is. Um, and even as he's singing, uh, a snarling orc voice rings out. Uh, I'm sorry, let's see. Now, let me read this next next paragraph. Beyond all towers, strong and high, he began again, and then he stopped short. He thought that he had heard a faint voice answering him, but now he could hear nothing. Yes, he could hear nothing, but not... He could hear something, but not a voice. Footsteps were approaching. Now a door was being opened quietly in the passage above. The hinges creaked. Sam crouched down, listening. The door closed with a dull thud, and then a snarling orc voice rang out. Hola, you up there, you dunghill rat. Stop your squeaking or I'll come and deal with you. Do you hear? There was no answer. All right, growled Snaga, but I'll come and have a look at you all the same and see what you're up to. The hinges creaked again and Sam, now peering over the corner of the passage threshold, saw a flicker of light in an open doorway and the dim shape of an orc coming out. He seemed to be carrying a ladder. Suddenly the answer dawned on Sam. The topmost chamber was reached by a trap door in the roof of the passage. 
Snaga thrust the ladder upward, steadied it, and then clambered out of sight. Sam heard a bolt drawn back. Then he heard the hideous voice speaking again. <clears throat> you lie quiet or you'll pay for it. You've, got, you've not got long to live in peace, I guess. But if you don't want the fun to begin right now, keep your trap shut. See? There's a reminder for you. There was a sound like the crack of a whip. And that makes Sam mad. Yeah. At, the sound, at, at that, rage blazed in Sam's heart to a sudden fury. He sprang up, ran, and went up the ladder like a cat. Uh, his head came out in the middle of the floor of a large round chamber. A red lamp hung from its roof. The westward window slit was high and dark. Something was lying on the floor by the wall under the window, but over it a large orc shape was straddled. It raised a whip a second time, but the blow never fell. With a cry, Sam leapt across the floor, sting in hand. The orc wheeled round, but before it could make a move, Sam slashed its whip hand from its arm. Howling with pain and fear, but desperate, the orc changed, charged head down at him. Sam's next blow went wide, and thrown off his balance, he fell backwards, clutching at the orc as it stumbled over him. Before he could scramble up, he heard a cry and a thud. The orc in its wild haste had tripped on the ladder head, and had fallen through the open trap door. Sam gave no more thought to it. He ran to the figure huddle on the floor. It was Frodo. Thus ends Snaga. Yeah. So. Breaks his neck. Yeah. Well, Sam, of course, hews off his whip arm. Oh, well, yeah. That was the beginning and, of the end. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Then he, and then he falls through the trap door. Right. Yeah. So Sam finally reunited with Frodo. Frodo awakens. Um, Frodo is, uh, you know, Frodo just doesn't know what's going on. Completely disoriented. Um, doesn't know whether he's been asleep for days, weeks, however long right. it is. Um, d- really doesn't even remember, uh, you know, being being stung, right, by Shelob. So it says, Something hit me, didn't it? And I fell into darkness and foul dreams and woke and found that waking was worse. Orcs were all around me. I think they had just been pouring some horrible burning drink down my throat. So um, as they talk a little more, it's clear that Frodo is feeling, you know, a good bit of despair. Um, you want to read this part that says they've taken everything, Sam? They've taken everything, Sam, said Frodo. Everything I had. Do you understand? Everything. He cowered on the floor again with bowed head as his own words brought home to him the fullness of the disaster and despair overwhelmed him. The quest has failed, Sam. Even if we get out of here, we can't escape. Only elves can escape. Away, away out of Middle-earth, far away over the sea. If even that is wide enough to keep the shadow out... No, not everything, Mr. Frodo, and it hasn't failed, not yet. I took it, Mr. Frodo, begging your pardon, and I've kept it safe. It's round my neck now, and a terrible burden it is, too. Sam fumbled for the ring and its chain. But I suppose you must take it back. Now it had come to it, Sam felt reluctant to give up. Now that it had come to it, Sam felt reluctant to give up the ring and burden his master with it again. It's interesting it says that he felt reluctant to give up the ring and burden his master with it again. Mm Mm-hmm. Right, so it's not so like, much that he wanted it for himself. Right. He didn't want to. Yeah. He wanted to carry it for, well, and, and to it, help Frodo. And it's the operation of the ring, right? You know, so it knows that Sam oh, is, yeah. uh, you know, has a good heart, and so it's mm-hmm. like, well, how can I start to have make, him manipulate? How, how can I? How can I use good intentions? Right. Right to make him feel like he like he needs to hang on to it. Right. Right. Interesting. Possessive of it. Yeah. Right. Trixie, Trixie. Um. You've got it, Grass Frodo. Gas Frodo, you've got it here. Sam, you're a marvel. Then quickly and strangely, his tone changed. Give it to me, he cried, standing up, holding out a trembling hand. Give it me at once. You can't have it. All right, Mr. Frodo, said Sam, rather startled. Here it is. Slowly, he drew the ring out and passed the chain over his head. But you're in the land of Mordor now, sir, and when you get out, you'll see the fiery mountain and all. You'll find the ring very dangerous now and very hard to bear. If it's too hard a job, I could share it with you, maybe. No, no, cried Frodo, snatching the ring and chain from Sam's hand. "'No, you won't, you thief!' he panted, staring at Sam with eyes wide with fear and enmity. Then suddenly, clasping the ring in one clenched fist, he stood aghast. A mist seemed to clear from his eyes, and he passed a hand over his aching brow. The hideous vision had seemed so real to him, half bemused as he was still with wound and fear. Sam had had changed before his very eyes into an orc again, leering and pawing at his treasure, a foul little creature with greedy eyes and slobbering mouth. But now the vision had passed.' There was Sam kneeling before him, his face wrung with pain, as if he had been stabbed in the heart. Tears welled from his eyes. Oh, Sam, what have I said? What have I done? Forgive me. 
After all you have done, it is the horrible power of the ring. I wish it had never, never been found. But don't mind me, Sam. I must carry the burden to the end. It can't be altered. You can't come between me and this doom. So, um, so Frodo, on awaking, sees the ring, knows that it's back, and all of a sudden he's not in despair anymore, but he's like, I want the ring. Right. All right. Yeah. The ring has really got a hold of him at this point. And Sam, you know, realizes, okay, it's, you know, I'll return it. I'll return it to Frodo. You know, he wants it. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so, uh, so now they have to figure out how do they complete the mission. Right. Right. Now they have to figure out how do they complete the mission. Now that it's not lost. Right. The quest has not failed as Frodo thought it had. Right. Um, they realize that the best thing to do uh, is they can't wander in looking like two hobbits. Right. And plus, Frodo has no clothes. Right. Yeah. So they decide to put on orc clothes. Yeah. So Smart. they go they go dressed up as orcs. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, you know, put on big cloaks and just kind of make themselves all the, the armor and, and all this kind of right. stuff. Um, so that's their that's their plot to get into the land. Um, so, and they do have a little bit, they do have, uh, you know, you know, have a little repast in order to um, increase their strength. Uh It said, now that you've had a mouthful, Sam, I won't budge. Here, take this elven cake and drink that last drop in your bottle. The whole thing is quite hopeless, so it's no good worrying about tomorrow. It probably won't come. So Frodo, even though he has the ring back, is is just, you know, he's been feeling more and more hopeless as they've gone on. And and he's just kind of given way to this despair. Despair. Yeah, yeah. Um, He's very close to giving up altogether. Yeah. Which is, you know, it's interesting because if you think about the objective, you know, if you think about their situation more objectively, yeah, they're in a difficult situation, extremely difficult, and their likelihood of succeeding not very good, but this, you know, this is not, uh, it's not hopeless. It's not truly hopeless, objectively speaking, right? Right. And furthermore, they've gotten this far, which is pretty incredible for two hobbits. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So you'd think that Instead, they'd be like, "Well, I know our chances are good, but but we have to press on, and there's there's mm. still a chance, you right. know. There's still a chance." Well, that's, I think that's Sam's attitude, right. right? It is, but but my point is that Frodo, there's something like a a spiritual and emotional kind of like mm-hmm. shadow that's being cast upon him, right? So that he well, can't the ring bearer. He can't think clearly. Yeah. Right. So anyway, it's just interesting because sometimes you get into difficult situations, and even though you're objectively your situation might, might might not be any different than it was the day before. Mm-hmm. It's just an everyday life, right? Your your situation might not be objectively any different than it was the day before, but you just feel overwhelmed spiritually and emotionally, and you're like, mm-hmm. I'm a fool for, for doing this. I know this in my own life, mm-hmm. just like later in the day. Mm-hmm. As the day gets later on, if I'm if I'm still thinking about work and things associated with work, yeah, I get I'm like it's hopeless, <laughs> you know. Right. I'm like. Whatever it is that I'm like thinking about with regard to you know with regard to work or the different things I'm doing in my life, it's like it's hopeless. You know, my no good doing this kind of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's 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 just no good. But it's like it's nothing is different from what it was earlier in the day, right? Right? Yeah. It's just my mind is is casting things in a different way. You right. know what I'm saying? Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, it totally makes sense, and I think. I think um, I think there's a lot of different factors that contribute to that. Mm-hmm. Um, I still remember when I was growing up, going in, going to my mom one evening and telling her I feel rejected and dejected. Mm-hmm. Those are my exact words. And she looked at me and she said, "Go to bed." Yeah. And I started crying. I was like, "You don't care about me. You don't love me." But then I realized later, like, well, duh, that was what I needed, right? Yeah. I needed a good night's sleep. I needed to just go to bed, sleep it off. And unfortunately, Frodo doesn't have that luxury right yeah. now. He can't just go to bed and sleep it off and wake up renewed and refreshed. Um, but he's, fortunately, he's been at this for a long time. And for, but fortunately, he does have Sam. He does have Sam, and yes. um, he has a he has a good friend that can help him. And, you know, keep him pointed forward. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, amazing what sleep can solve for you. Yeah. So, and food. Yeah. Um, so the chapter ends. Um, well, this is a cool ending. Yeah, it is a cool ending. You want to you yeah. read the last? So maybe starting at Frodo had no strength for such a battle. Sure. So they come up against the the Watchers again, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Uh, and it says, Frodo had no strength for such a battle. He sank to the ground. I can't go on, Sam, he murmured. I'm going to faint. I don't know what's come over me. I do, Mr. Frodo. Hold up now. It's the gate. There's some devilry there. But I got through, and I'm going to get out. It can't be more dangerous than before. Now for it. Again, Sam drew out the elven glass of Galadriel, as if to do honor to his hardihood and to grace with splendor his faithful brown hobbit hand that had done such deeds. The field blazed forth suddenly, so that all the shadowy court was lit with a dazzling radiance like lightning, but it remained steady and did not pass. Gethoniel, El Elrath, Sam cried, for why he did not know, his thoughts sprang back suddenly to the elves in the Shire, and the song that drove away the black rider in the trees. You're going to do Frodo's voice now. Oh. <laughs> Aya Elinia Nankalima, cried Frodo once again behind him. The will of the watchers was broken with a suddenness like the snapping of a cord, and Frodo and Sam stumbled forward. Then they ran, through the gate and past the great seated figures with their glittering eyes. There was a crack. The keystone of the arch crashed almost on their heels, and the wall above crumbled and fell in ruin. Only by a hair did they escape. A bell clanged, and from the watchers there went up a high and dreadful wail. Far up above in the darkness it was answered. Out of the black sky there came dropping like a bolt, a winged shape, rending the clouds with a ghastly shriek. Uh-oh. Yeah, cliffhanger. Cliffhanger. So interesting that on the way out, the feel itself didn't get them through. Mm -hmm. They actually had to speak right the elven you know the name of of uh elabreth right and so they, uh, they do you speak... know what frodo says there yeah he says uh he says hail brightest of the stars right mm -hmm. so aya elinian and kalima means hail brightest of the stars they're invoking elbereth varda yeah right okay. elbereth elbereth gothoniel is uh oh elbereth star kindler right Got it. And Aya Elenian and Kalima is Hail Brightest of the Stars. Right. Powerful names. Yes. So not only did they get them through, but it broke. Right. It broke the defense. Right. And uh, down, it broke the defense. Well, it broke the defense. They're able to escape, but... Right, but, but now there's a Nazgul. The wall comes crashing down, yeah. and the alarm goes up, and the Nazgul is coming for them. So. Yeah. Oops, I just bumped the table. Oh, Sorry. darn. Um, yeah, but... Uh, <clears throat> Just from, you know, no rest for the weary. No. From, from one, uh, from one adventure to the next. Out of the frying pan into the fire. That's exactly right. All right. Any any more? Any further thoughts? No. I'm ready for some haiku, yo. Let's do it. Where's our music? There it is. I hope I remember the words. It's been a while. It has been. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen syllables in haku. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen syllables in haku. Ow! Oh, yeah, babies. All right. All righty, Rudy. <clears throat> Rock, paper, Rock. scissors? Let's Rock. do it. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh. All right. Who goes first? I'll go first. All right. Strange menace watches. What hideous strength restrains Sam the stout-hearted? Hmm. Is that about the watchers? Yeah. I like it. Yeah. The hideous strength thing is a little reference to uh, one of C.S. Lewis's books. That hideous called that hideous strength. Oh. Yeah. Fancy schmancy. Yes. I like it. Well done. All right, here's mine. For love of friend, he goes forth. Refreshed by light, song, he conquers, then flees. Nice. Yeah. Right on. I wanted to say he conquers, frees, flees, but then I thought it would sound like he freed the fleas, which is not what I wanted to say. So I changed it. He didn't free fleas. He didn't free fleas? No. That's what I was saying. I wanted to say he conquers freeze fleas. And I was like, oh, they didn't free fleas. So that doesn't work. <laughs> anyway. Cool. 
Uh, yeah, we only have uh, we only uh, heard from Greg this time around. Well, we also got a new we got, we got a new contact. Um, oh, cool beans! Yes, this is from uh, Michael Noel. This is and a haiku. No, this is not a haiku. Well, I oh, haiku you got the haiku. Greg. I see. So I'm saying let's stick with haiku, and let's there will do be it. new contacts. Right. Awesome. Okay. Um, Greg says greetings, Guardians of the Tolkien Road. Glad he says he's glad to hear from us. He was a little worried. He thought we had maybe like gone into Mordor or not come out, I guess. Um, but thanks for the concern. We're happy to be back. Um, he has two haiku. Here's the first. Tri-bodied statues. Spirits guarding the tower. Corrupt sentinels. So you and Greg, you were kind of like feeling those watchers. You were kind oh, of yeah. on, the, on the same, same wavelength. wavelength. I was going to say brain length, but that wasn't... (laughs) Brain length. You both both have long brains. Long brains. (laughs) Um, Greg says the two watchers are fascinating things. Yeah. Could they be a twisted version of the Sentinels of Numenor? Hmm. That's a really interesting question because I had them pictured. I had them pictured in my brain, but then I realized, no, I'm picturing... The other ones. Yeah. And I guess that's what they're called, the Sentinels of Numenor. Right. Right? When they're, when they're in the boat. Yeah. Right? When they're going down the Anduin. Right. That's where they are. The big, tall statues. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, 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 I can totally see that. Yeah. They might be. They very well could be. Good stuff, Greg. I'm going to let John read your next one. Simple Hobbit hymns. Sam sings in desperation and finds his master. Good stuff. Right on. Very touching scene. Yeah, this, this probably you probably called out my two favorite uh, yeah parts of the chapter. Very touching scene where Sam sings and finds Frodo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. As always, thank you, Greg. Always wonderful hearing from you guys. Mm-hmm. Um. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. All right. So, so we have a new contact. Yeah, we have a new contact. Super it's exciting. from Michael Noel. He says, uh, "He says we're legit." Oh. Dude. For coming through on the regular with this endeavor. He said, it helps me get through my shifts late night at a gym. My job is pretty fresh, but this helps keep my mind sharp thinking about Tolkien instead of staring at yoga pants. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. That's awesome. You're welcome. Yes. I love, the, I love the image of somebody listening to us while they work at a gym. I know. Right on. That is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Getting... Thanks. Uh, is it Michael you said? That's right. Nice. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh he says, could you speculate on the dead body that Aragorn kneels at when summoning the King of the Dead and what is the Seven of Nine talk regarding? Seven of Nine. That must, seven of Nine must be, um, I was probably referring to Star Trek Voyager when I said Seven of Nine at some point. I would point. have no idea. Yeah, so that's a character on Star Trek is Seven um, uh, on Star Trek Voyager. So that must be what that reference is to. Now, as far as Aragorn kneels when summoning the King of the Dead... Oh, is this when he's in the paths of the dead? Or is this when he's doing the harrowing of... I must be. I, you know, Michael, I'll have, to go back and, I'll have to go back and investigate this a little more closely, so I'm going to make a note of it for next time so that I can remember to dig into this one. Um, I wonder how late that gym that he works at is open. I didn't think our gym was open that late. Yeah, it must be a gym in a city or something like that. Yeah, so. where people are like... Work out all hours. Maybe it's a twenty-four hour gym. That'd be great. Like if you couldn't sleep, you could just like go to the gym at like yeah. two a.m. That'd be pretty cool. Let's see here. So you said seven of nine. So seven's the character. Where's the nine come from? Um, she's a Borg, and the Borg are, um, the Borg are this like cybernetic race that like thinks of themselves as part of this collective okay, so stop right there yeah you lost me well you asked <laughs> i know so... I, I didn't realize the answer was going to be so complicated <laughs> <laughs> stop <laughs> nerd i don't want to hear you're it a nerd <laughs> got you, you to and answer your pocket nerd. projector you just need to go back to your go back to your good cables. answer john you want a pocket protector <laughs> um yeah, yeah, so um, I'll have to write that down to look up more um, for next time. King of the the dead body. Yeah. And the king of the dead spirit. 
What is the body that Aragorn kneels? I'm glad that our listeners are listening to you type right now. Yeah, well, I'm sure it's keeping them on the edge of their seat. Gotta make. I want to make sure I get an answer to Michael. No, you know? I think that's terrific. So, um, so yeah, awesome note. He says, mm-hmm. uh, he says, your brother in Christ, much love and blessing to your families and hard work. Well, thank wow. you. Thank you very much. That very is kind really note. encouraging. Really, really encouraging. Truly appreciate it, Michael. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Um, and, uh, yeah, and hey, you know, for all those others who are out there listening, um, much highly recommend listening to the Tolkien Road rather than staring at yoga pants. So, <laughs> much better for the brain, in my opinion. So, yep. Yeah. I would agree. <laughs> right. yeah. Um So, and, and, and in seriousness, yeah, we always love hearing from new people. Yes. We say this all the time, but we do. Yes. Never fails. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know there's lots of you out there who we've never heard from, and mm-hmm. so, what are you waiting for? Give us a shout out. Yes, please do. Um, all right, Michael, I will do my best. If I don't get it on the, if I don't get you an ep- answer on the next episode, then send me another note and remind me because sometimes things just get away from me. But I made a note of it. Cracks. So we're gonna try to get you an answer. Cool beans. And uh, and hopefully we're back on track. We're gonna be you know kind of cruising through uh, the rest of book six and get through Lord of the Rings. Um, and well, Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up, it might be a little. Yeah, it might be a little hairy, but we're gonna yeah. try. We're gonna try to keep the pace going. Okay. We're gonna try to deliver because we, we took we took a little bit. We took a little bit of a break. So. But now our off season has started. Um, so. and it, you know I'm excited uh, if if we start hearing big news about you know Middle Earth TV shows and mo- and Tolkien movies and that kind of stuff, we're gonna have a lot more to talk about too with that regard to that kind of stuff. True. So. True. true. Um, it's exciting that we're getting so close to the end of Lord of the Rings. We're going to uh-huh. do The Hobbit right after that. Well, first we've got to do our movie review episode. We'll do the movie review episode. That's always episode. super fun. Right. Yeah. And then The Hobbit. Yeah. I love The Hobbit. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe uh, maybe our... Um, yeah, that'll be fun. Yes. I'm excited about The Hobbit. Moe's death. It'll be the third time I've read it. All right. Um, any other thoughts? Any other things no. to share? Any other so correspondence? It's uh, good to be back into it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks yep. to our patrons, Y'all Rock, executive producers, Dr. William Hutton and Justine Lloyd, as well as Shannon Stockbridge, Josh Sosa, Brian Orr, Margaret Lyon, Emilio Perea, Zeke Farmer, Caleb Santana, James Applegate, Caitlin Fascista, Matt Scarrance, Al Taylor, Per Brenner, James Lindbergh, Chris Loftus, Lawrence McGowan, and Richard Wall. We appreciate you, you all. You guys are the best. And, Thank you. And we uh, thanks to everyone who listens and who corresponds. Mm-hmm. Always love hearing from you guys. Always, always, always. And we will talk at you next time. Yes. All right. Thanks, yeah. guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Please remember to check out truemyths.org and tolkienroad.com for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes and consider supporting us financially via patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. On our next episode, we'll continue our journey through The Lord of the Rings with Book 6, Chapter 2, The Land of Shadow. Please send correspondence to Tolkien Road Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on.